Hello from Geneva and welcome to People's Dispatch. Uh, we are here at the 76th World Health Assembly uh, where the countries and civil society, activists and other stakeholders come together to discuss the most pertinent issues, health issues of our times. Apart from the proceedings of the assembly itself, a lot of events happen around the same time in Geneva. One of the most important events that happened last week uh, was release of a report on new treatments of Ebola. It was released by Médecins Sans Frontières in French and uh, Doctors Without Borders in English. Um, the report uh, uh, very correctly points out that there are a lot of barriers in accessing Ebola treatments by people who need it the most, which is primarily in Africa. Uh, it was in 2020 that two new uh, medicines and treatments were approved the approved by it was in 2020 that two new treatments or medicines were approved by the US FDA and they should have been uh, able uh, to be accessed by people who have since suffered from uh, the fatal disease however we have seen many outbreaks in Africa since then and these treatments have not reached those people what are the reasons and what do we have to learn from them uh, when we are discussing the new pandemic treaty is something what we will discuss today. We are joined by Francisco Viegas from uh, MSF Access Campaign, uh, which is the policy think tank of uh, uh, the organization. And Francisco is based in Brazil and has been following the uh, pandemic treaty and other intellectual property related issues uh, for a long time. Welcome to the show, Francisco. Uh, so as we were discussing the uh, report by MSF that clearly shows that despite having two new treatments, uh, we had outbreaks in Africa and people were not able to get those treatments and Ebola is one of the most fatal diseases as we know. Um, so, uh, and the reason also was that uh, the company, while the, keeping the price very high, actually United States has holding the all those treatments which are available <laughs> today. Um, we saw similar things happening during COVID-19 also when the vaccines were hoarded by, by, uh, by the Western nations. So through all these things, uh, what do you think is something that we can learn when the world is discussing pandemic treaty because Ebola itself is a pandemic? Uh, and epidemic that we keep talking uh, uh, I mean uh, uh, a disease that can lead into pan uh, turn into a pandemic later so mm -hmm. what can we learn from that no thank you thank you very much for the question I think our our main points on on launching this this report now uh, was to draw the lessons of the challenges of inequity and access to the Ebola treatments and particularly that you need to to discuss in advance and develop in advance binding access conditions early on in the R&D uh, process to make sure that those products that are developed in the end get to the hands that from people that from people that actually need those treatments and what we have seen from this example is that the opposite has happened and nowadays the the only stockpile that exists for these treatments are in the US with a biosecurity approach and if and any, any an outbreak occurs right now for Ebola no country in the world even countries that have been more uh, having this disease um, happen uh, outbreaks happening in the country won't have a access to those treatments. So it's it's an important example of how countries should take this in consideration during the negotiations of the pandemic accord and the whole PPR response, uh, pandemic preparedness and response uh, preparation, need to think about how they need to develop access conditions early on uh, to the development of those tools to make sure that people get it in the end, basically. Yeah, so I think access and uh, benefit sharing is something that at the WHO has been discussed for a long time also. Um, but uh, there has been no consensus on that so far. Uh, so, but do you think that if we talk about pandemic treaty, uh, the global north or the rich countries, um, are they going to re really accept it now when they have not re accepted it over the past so many decades when there has been so much push? Still. No, it's an excellent uh, topic and it's one of the main controversies that are currently uh, having the pandemic treaty discussions in which we see countries from the north really resisting any language that uh, benefits countries that have shared pathogens, biological materials or samples that have uh, ultimately contributed to the de development of uh, medical tools wow. and such as treatment right. of vaccines. And this is one of the, 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 the topics of greater, greatest controversy and we hope that developing countries are able to hold their stance to make sure that actually benefits are derived from the contribution of patients and the, and, and also the, the information that they share with the broader uh, uh, 
community, scientific community to develop those drugs. Uh, and this is, has happened in the past, as, as you know, in terms of the uh, pandemic influenza response, the whole framework that was developed within WHO for preparedness was because Indonesia shared the samples for uh, flu uh, influenza uh, vaccine development, and then they never got the actual vaccines that came out of this development. So it's not a, a theoretical uh, consideration, it's a, it's a living practice and a living inequity that has happened in the past. And we're concerned that this will happen again and again if you not if you don't have an, a strong framework that enables benefits arriving from the sharing of pathogens. Thank you. So you talk about lived experiences which we have had so far. Um, so most when we talk about pandemic treaty, uh, what comes to mind is COVID-19 and the experiences from there. But at the same time, we have seen in the past many other pandemics and epidemics have occurred, be it the HIV AIDS uh, crisis that the world went through or the SARS scare that had happened. So uh, beyond COVID, and say now we have already discussed Ebola. What are the learnings that we have also mm -hmm. in terms of intellectual property that mm -hmm. should inform when we are discussing uh, the pandemic treaty uh, at the moment? I think it's an excellent question because uh, the access to medicines movement uh, and MSF specifically also ha have learned hard, hard lessons from across the, the years in which we have seen that voluntary approaches that are based in either voluntary licenses or sharing of intellectual property more on a, uh, a voluntary basis have not been sufficient to actually address the access challenges and and the need for increased uh, treatments across the globe. Because if we consider existing disease challenges that are, are happening nowadays, even for hepatitis C, less than 40% of the world, world currently has treatments for hepatitis C. The same for, for HIV, in which less than 60% of the population broadly has access to the treatments they need in different in difficult settings. So. Uh, it's not a, a, a challenge, sadly, that's specific to pandemics or to outbreaks that happen in a severe case. It's a day-to-day -day challenge that we f we face in in our operations, but also in, in developing countries of the inequity of access. So we're bringing those lessons to try to prevent that this continue to happen uh, with new diseases, with new pathogens, and uh, in a larger scale when we see during a pandemic, in which was basically a, a uh, uh, acute problem of a chronic uh, issue of inequity uh, of access consideration. So that's why during the pandemic, uh, MSF particularly and the access campaign push for a, a, a TRIPS waiver, for a waiver of intellectual property rights and for a cre increased sharing of intellectual property, not, not only intellectual property, but know-how and, and increasing manuf to enable increasing manufacturing capacity, not only for vaccines, but for treatments and, and diagnostics. And we haven't seen this during one of the more severe crises of, of access that we have lived in the, uh, recently. So that's why we want to prevent this from happening again. And that's why we're asking for those commitments to be binding so that we actually are able to change the, the status quo of, of inequity that we see across the board in terms of access to medicines. Right. Um, so you are talking about voluntary uh, and binding again and again. And I think that is a very important point, uh, whether we talk about access and benefit sharing or uh, the intellectual property rights that they should not be held, they should be less monopoly uh, and all of that. Um, so uh, again, if I talk about pandemic treaty, we are seeing that these provisions are, uh, I mean, there is a, uh, an attempt to insert the provisions where intellectual property rights uh, should not lead to monopoly and there should not be any barriers uh, during pandemic. Uh, but uh, again, we are seeing a lot of um, uh, pushback by the global north uh, mm -hmm. and um, and uh, the um, which are dictated by the pharmaceutical companies and other corporations. Um, so, but uh, in that sense, uh, do you think if uh, I mean, there is a possibility of actually uh, not letting intellect, I mean, uh, uh, doing something regarding intellectual property barriers because in the TRIPS waiver, we saw that despite so much of uh, uh, mobilization and all the developing countries coming together, uh, it was a very watered down uh, 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 document that we finally got. Um, so what kind of hopes can we have uh, in the pandemic accord that this wouldn't happen? or what is being done about it in that sense. Exactly. No, I think that this is one of the huge, huge challenges for, for these negotiations, to make sure that there is actual in strong commitments that actually change the status quo, and that's what we're trying to push. But, but those topics are always complicated because countries have vested interests 
uh, the whole negotiation is happening at closed doors. It's something that civil society groups broadly uh, have asked for increased transparency of the negotiations and having uh, a seat at the table to listen to countries what are their actual proposals because this goes beyond uh, the World Health Organization has impacting people's lives and livelihoods across uh, across the world. So it's something that should be uh, open to uh, larger scrutiny uh, to enable uh, a strong position to be taken in terms of, uh, of the, ac uh, the, the equity and, and, and access in, in, in the future. So in terms of intellectual property, actually getting a strong commitment will be a, a huge challenge. The last text from the Bureau has been le leaked in different media. Yes. And, and the first reactions that we are taking is that a lot of the language is based on mutually agreed terms. And we have, and we, you can imagine in an outbreak response where everybody's struggling to get access to the same products at the same time with limited manufacturing capacity, limited availability, to start negotiating access to it and what are the terms is not even a practical solution, not to mention uh, able to provide access more broadly and, and in a, an expedited manner. So it's one of our concerns that this tax is very, being very much watered down and without strong commitment. So in terms of intellectual property, in terms of access and access conditions, most of the issues regarding the conditions that member states and countries could push when they fund R&D, when they purchase in advance health products, those have been mostly stricken down from the current uh, document. So a lot of the things that are crucial for developing countries, we're seeing that are not sufficiently taken in consideration in this in this last draft. So we hope that uh, countries are able to push back more strongly and, and together with civil society groups. And, and for this is key for us to communicate more broadly about what's happening here, what's happening in these negotiations, what to the larger community, because uh, once we discuss this with, uh, in an uh, in a open conversation, most people are in favor of, of, of the things we're pushing for, for increased access and inequity, because everybody's life has been touched in a way or another uh, in this pandemic for and people have have lost family members and and dear ones uh, across the globe so it's something that we need to 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 consider this momentum and not lose this momentum of uh, of inequity that we have lived so recently so that's one of our concerns yeah right access and benefit sharing doing away with intellectual property barriers and more transparency where uh, the common people and civil society knows what is going on uh, during IHR and INB discussions. These are the things that we need uh, to have a more equitable pandemic accord. And we hope that the developing countries uh, will stick to their ground and do not give up on these important topics which impact lives more uh, in uh, these uh, nations who do not finally get access to medicines and medical products uh, in wake of intellectual property and other barriers. Thank you for joining us, Francisco. Thank you.